Welcome in. It is Big Ten today. We are presented by Old National Bank on this Wednesday. Dave Refs and Anthony Heron, no Pat Forty this week. We'll get back to him next week. So the floor is almost entirely yours. And I made sure I had a freshly shaven head. I was for gonna, you. I was gonna say that. Yeah, it I really mean, it's, looks. It's got to be glistening. It really right looks good. <laughs> I, I try to make sure when I show up on Wednesdays, you get the full grooming. Later in the week, other appearances I may do won't be quite as well coiffed. All right, well, we're going to have to do a compare and contrast on that. Yeah I'm, yeah, I'm interested to see what you look like on Saturday because you're oh, on Saturday. Yeah, it's a delicate balance between now and Saturday. <laughs> Let's get to our big story. We can talk about Anthony's grooming habits all day, <laughs> but it's not technically our big story. The week Fair. seven action is we've got six games coming up on Saturday, five conference matchups, big one at Camp Randall, Iowa, and Wisconsin, that is for first place in the West. Second-ranked Michigan hosting Indiana. Number three, Ohio State goes to Purdue. The last non-conference game of the year. Oh. It's actually here on the Big Ten Network. Number six, Penn State welcoming UMass. Let's start, though, with the Buckeyes. They get Penn State next week. Mm -hmm. So they both have you know, one more game before they get to that one. Penn State is not nearly as challenging as Ohio State's is. Ohio State goes to Purdue. We know they've had trouble with the Boilermakers through the years. How do you assess Ohio State as they head into this game before the game, or at least game before the first <laughs> right. of several games for them? Yeah, their, their focus, I, I think the intensity of Ohio State's focus will, will be tested, and I think in a positive way, because when you do have championship expectations on an annual basis, as Ohio State does, then these are the types of tests, not just when you step onto the field and wondering whether or not, you know, this huge personnel advantage will result in a blowout. But after a game where you played against a team where personnel, the expectations going in is that it was going to be competitive and you withstood that test, responding again the following week with a similar degree of intensity, of focus, that's a challenge as well. The intangible challenge of making sure you are prepared for the opponent, for the stage that will come before the stage because we know what awaits Ohio State with their schedule moving forward here and since 1947 Dave oh the, I like where this is going I don't even know where it's going <laughs> but anytime yes you go back in in history you know I love it so all right. I'm all ears yes so let's see if, if there's actually a yes. Big Ten football historical fact yeah, you don't yeah, know right every head coach Everyone. of Ohio State yeah. University football has yeah. lost on the road in West Live since 1947. Every man who has coached Ohio State football wow. has lost at Purdue since that year. So right now. So Ryan Day is due for what is what you're saying. I mean, that's what history tells us. All and right. so hopefully that is a factor that so, he will feed his locker room. If I'm Ryan Day, I'm saying, well, I'm going to have this job for 30 years. So it doesn't have to happen <laughs> this year, right? I don't have to lose you. No, this year, but hey, right we now. remember the Tyler Trent game. Yep. 2018. Mm -hmm. and, and we know, too, the recent history of Purdue. I mean, three of the last four games against top five teams, they have won. Right. So this is a team that does win games of this magnitude. Are you concerned at all? I mean, I understand what you say about Ohio State rising to the challenge against Maryland and looking at the final score. I think a lot of people would say, yeah, they did. But those of us who watch it closely, I think, no, they were a little listless yeah. there in the first half. Maybe you could even take out the a little. They were just listless. So... Again, I don't know whether that hurts them or not against Purdue, but I would say that would hurt them against Penn State and it would hurt them against Michigan. Are you concerned of what they look like, about what they look like in the first half last week? I think, too, listless is a good word for it. And, by the way, I should credit Spencer Holbrook, who gave me that factoid on Big Ten Radio earlier this week. But okay. listless is a good word for the way they look. Because well, I'm not an English like, major, but I, I sit next to one <laughs> right, every of Wednesday. Course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. And I think the way that Maryland was able to control the line of scrimmage in that game against Ohio State is worthy of concern because especially the offensive line for the Buckeyes has been something that's gotten additional scrutiny throughout the offseason and coming into this point in the season and then not having Trayvon Henderson in that game last week, then you wonder, all right, will they still be able to run the football effectively because we view them as having a deep backfield. We know that there are other backs in that lineup that have had big moments, whether it's Chip Traynham, whether it's been Mayan Williams, but they were stymied at the line of scrimmage by Maryland for most of that contest. So Purdue is not as formidable up front, specifically with their defensive line. But from a matchup perspective, they can present problems with you as an offensive line, hitting your landmarks, finding what the blocking assignment should be because they'll, they'll align in a variety of ways and show you some, some late movement pre-snap that make it really difficult to target 
the folks in the front seven that you're trying to hit. And so if they're not locked in, if they're not focused, it's going to be a very big deal because Purdue, not only with their defense, has the ability for the splash play, but certainly on offense. They might give you the football, yes. but they might throw it over your head too. Right. No, they're a big play offense. I mean, we have seen them break a lot of them this year. And, right. and in terms of plays at 10 yards or longer, they're towards the, the very top of the Big Ten. And then defensively, they can – they can create some havoc, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they're giving up a lot of yards, right. but they can come up with big plays. They're, again, among the top tackles for loss in the Big Ten. What is, if there's kind of one area where you would say, well, that's something where Purdue really could create an advantage for themselves in this game, where would that be? Well, Ryan Day as an offensive play caller, really not only this season, but even going back to last year, there's been some conversation about how, quote-unquote, conservative he's gotten. I, I just think more run-pass balance is just beneficial on the whole, and especially when you know you have a defense that can perform at the level Ohio State has this season. To be close to the vest a bit on offense is good. But Purdue's defense and some of that havoc that you referenced, they have the potential to put Kyle McCord in a position that he hasn't been in, not only not having a big lead in the game or not throwing the ball well early, but maybe force some takeaways. And that's where, you know, Emeka Buka, we're not sure where he's at health-wise, and Marvin Harrison Jr., we know he played really well still last week, but he's a bit banged up as well. Ryan Day ended up alluding to Trayvon Henderson being available this week. But the weaponry for the Buckeyes, even after a bye week, still is a little bit banged up. So if Purdue, with some of those havoc moments, with a well-timed blitz, can you get a strip sack? Can you take the ball away because of an errant pass, especially before Kyle McCord really gets into a rhythm? Because in a young career, I'd say that's, that's one thing we're starting to recognize about Kyle McCord is he's a bit of a slow starter before he really gets into the rhythm of the game. And that's common with a lot of young quarterbacks. But early on, that to me is where Ryan Walter should attack. He yeah. should bring the house at that Buckeye backfield. See if you can overwhelm the offensive line with scheme. See if you can overwhelm a young quarterback with a disguised coverage. And then that's where for Purdue, it's incumbent upon those on the back end. If you got a chance to make a play, you're not going for a pass deflection. You're going for a pick six, man. See if you can get a house call and really electrify your home crowd and see if you can start to build your own momentum early in the game because Ohio State has started a bit slow on offense in some of these contests. Interested to see that one, but you know if there is a potential chess match involved, Ryan Walters is fired up. Yeah, that. man. You know, yeah. like that. That is for him. That's his, his comfort zone. That's mm -hmm. where he flourishes. So that should be a really good one. I'm interested, of course, in Iowa and Wisconsin for a number of reasons. To me, you look at this game, and, and I think you can make a really strong argument that whoever wins it at least has the inside track right. to playing in Indy. It's also fascinating because when we were talking about this beforehand, there's so much criticism of Iowa. <laughs> and yet you look at the one loss record, and they are winning games. You have this fascinating subplot. Of Deacon Hill against his former team, mm -hmm. right? He started his career at Wisconsin. He was all set to go to Fordham before Iowa intervenes and, and grabs him out of the portal. And now he's the starting quarterback going into Camp Randall. So a ton of intrigue here. What ultimately decides this one? <laughs> As it tends to be the case when the Badgers and the Hawkeyes meet, the line of scrimmage is going to be a very big deal in this game because, I mean, from Wisconsin's perspective, with this new Phil Longo offense, we were wondering how well they would throw the football. And here through the first half-ish of the season, they haven't lit up the night sky, you know, from a passing perspective. But we know Tanner Mordecai has more than enough resume coming in to think that, that he is capable of that. But he does need to protect the football against this Iowa secondary. We've seen Cooper DeJean start to get his game going on the back end, taking the football away when the opportunity presents itself there. But on the line of scrimmage, an offensive line for the Hawkeyes that is coming off of a quality performance against that Purdue defensive front that I've referenced that can present problems. And I was a bit banged up on the offensive line as well, where Nick DeYoung wasn't able to play last week and Mason Richmond just narrowly was able to play and ended up playing well last week. Iowa a bit banged up on the offensive line, and I think Wisconsin's defensive front is starting to grow, starting to emerge and figure some things out uh, coming off of a bye week they had before that Rutgers game. So right. I think the, the interior line of scrimmage where both teams will benefit from the ability to run the football, whether it's Braylon Allen for Wisconsin or now a healthy Kalen Johnson 
for Iowa. One of those individuals will have to make sure they really impact the game to control the tempo. And both of them want to play that similar style anyway. But whoever does it more effectively will put their, their signal caller. Obviously, one in Wisconsin's case has far more experience than the other. But that's where an offense can now find that rhythm and set up the play action opportunities that each would like to take advantage of. I'm fascinated to see whether or not Iowa can cause some turnovers. Because to me, I just feel like they they back themselves into this corner a little bit where if you don't do that, hmm. it's going to be really hard to win the game. Yeah. And Tanner Mordecai, like early in the year, Wisconsin was turning it over. They were fumbling the ball. They just weren't, it, they weren't securing the football. But now here these last three games have only turned it over three times. Iowa, as we know, kind of flourishes off of that. Mm-hmm. I guess I just wonder, it, it, is there something else? Like, is there another way that they can win the game? And you mentioned, like, Caleb Johnson – Really good. I mean, and LeSean Williams, too. So it feels like, hey, if they can run the ball like they did a week ago, they can compete with anyone. But, man, this is it's a tough environment for Deacon Hill. I, I just feel like Iowa's defense is going to have to do something big for them to win this game. And Because you referenced Deacon Hill. I mean, his second career start, getting to do so against – his old team. I mean, do you think he's going to feel a few jitters? Like you, you would think so. I, I mean, I would, you right? Would I mean, so. I think it's just a huge, like, it's a prove it moment for mm. him. He was passed up on the depth chart right, there. Right. Felt like he didn't really have a, a, a future going forward. I don't know. I he can hear revenge really, game. I, I yeah. hear it. I feel it in your voice there that this is going to happen. I it guess I just manifest. wonder with a young quarterback, do you do you press? And and Kirk has made the point that he felt like he was pressing right. last week, and so now you're in this environment where. It's a little bit heightened emotion, and I don't know. I think it's fascinating on that level is Very much how so. people respond in, in moments like that. Very much so, and it, it feels like it can go either of two ways because from Deacon Hill's perspective, returning to an environment that he's familiar with, which will be far more hostile to him now as the opponent going back to Camp Randall Stadium, but how does he respond to that? It, is it overwhelming in some ways? But I don't know, in a second career start where, where he was playing with a bit anxious and even he admitted that a bit after the game just being a bit anxious and a little bit too amped up and like you reference his head coach Kirk Ferentz referenced that as well is there an enhanced level of comfort with that because you know the stadium you know the opponent and frankly you know that the strength of your arm was maybe over accentuated on a number of passes in that first start and just to take a deep breath and say that if Eric All is open, I can just float the football and know he's got the ability to go up and high point it. If Caleb Brown is there on a swing pass, I can make it more catchable instead of trying to fire it in there. Or Nico Ragaini on a deep route. I think now seeing yourself on film, especially when you're in the infancy of your time being a key portion of a lineup, that does help. And so going from start one to start two, I wonder how big of a jump there will be the potential for Deacon Hill to make because Wisconsin's defense was better against Rutgers, but they haven't been an overwhelming defense so far this season. So if he can just sort of deliver the football with more calm, a little bit more finesse, then this Iowa passing attack has more potential than what they've shown. Well, you have to figure out a way to get the wide receivers involved. I mean, right. literally to have a game where they have zero catches. Yeah. Combined, right? I mean, they, they have 20 catches on the year. The entire group, there are 19 players mm-hmm. in the Big Ten who have more than 20 catches. So, have more catches than all of Iowa's wide yeah. receivers together. So, again, can you win a game playing like that? We'll see. We'll, we'll find Eric out. Eric is really good, though. No, too. I agree. Look, I get, I, again. If I mean, he they, gets the majority of your catches but puts a couple in the end zone, you're Far be it from us to doubt anything <laughs> I was doing, right? Because not only are they doing it this year successfully, they've done it for years and years and years. But, again, this feels like somewhat of an extreme version yeah. of it. So, so we'll see. Our big stat is brought to you by Old National Bank. The top three in the Big Ten are truly the top three on both sides of the ball. Michigan, Ohio State, and Penn State, all among the top three in the conference in scoring offense and scoring defense, which is a good combination. It's the D where the conference really shines, though. The Wolverines, Nittany Lions, Buckeyes, one, two, and three in the nation in scoring defense, respectively. Now that top-ranked Wolverine scoring D gets a team that is in a little bit of offensive flux here in Indiana. They had a bye week after letting Walt Bell go, so now Rod Carey is the offensive coordinator to what extent is that a factor, do you think, for Michigan coming into this game, kind of this element of the unknown a little bit with what Indiana might bring? You would imagine that, that Jim Harbaugh and his coaching staff, that they're not necessarily anticipating something drastically different from the right. Hoosiers. I mean, having a bye week does at least give you the ability 
to adjust some things, some personnel, perhaps, you know, situationally after a self-scout, you say, all right, how, how can we enhance what Walt Bell was doing? But Rod Carey, while he's been around the program, he hasn't been in a position to actually coach these players. And, you know, would he come in and change terminology over a bye week? That, that would probably be a, a long shot there. So I, I do think that some things can be tweaked, adjusted, perhaps even a starting quarterback, things along those lines from a personnel perspective. But who Indiana had been leading into their bye is likely to a large extent still to be a very similar team. Now, the thing is, they did do a variety of, of, of stuff. They did a lot of stuff. They, they did some option. They did a lot of spread passing. Right. They did some tempo. They slowed it down. And maybe that was a part of what was the undoing of Walt Bell and not being able to, to find a focal point that their offense was best at and make that be an area where, where the team, where the offense as a whole could improve. But I think Michigan is likely seen on film because of a lot of the bodies that Indiana rotates through and the variety of schemes that they've tried to attack with at times. I, I think Mike Mentor and the Wolverines have likely seen whatever Indiana will throw at them. Uh, Jesse Mentor, excuse me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, interesting. I mean, again, look, this has not been a good offense this year. They're last in the Power Five in terms of points per game against the FBS. So, uh, again, I think to your point, can you drastically overhaul it? Here in two weeks, probably not. Mm -hmm. And you just look at how good Michigan's been. I mean, Minnesota didn't have a single snap in the red zone, right? Remember, they yeah. scored their yeah. touchdown on a long play just before the half. Zero snaps in the red zone. Michigan's had one penalty the last two weeks. I mean, That's it's the just most astounding it's thing incredible. about this season so far. <laughs> it just feels like a team that is clicking on all cylinders. I understand they have not played an elite team mm -hmm. yet. And, and you can point a finger at the non-conference schedule, and, and I get that. But to hear P.J. Fleck say after the game, this is the best team I've coached <laughs> against in 11 years, yeah. I mean, you could say, well, maybe he's trying to help himself out because they got blown out. But I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know why you would say that if you didn't believe it. Right? Right. I, I don't know why you'd say that if, if you didn't think, man, these guys are really good. And I think There's anyone, a lot of evidence yeah, to support I, I, it. I was going to say, anyone who's watched them <laughs> would say, like, are they the best team? You know, who knows? Uh, you have to go through. But, but man, they're awfully good. I mean, he's played, he's coached against Ohio State yes, a couple of times yes. in his time. There are teams that made the college football playoff. No but doubt. The, the level of execution that's happening in Ann Arbor in all phases, I mean, you know, the, the whole not getting a penalty thing, there are some really talented teams who sort of get beyond themselves in certain phases of the game. And all right, we have an infraction here or there, whether it's pre-snap, where there's being a bit too aggressive post-snap, going beyond the echo of the whistle, things like that. And Michigan is just doing everything well. And, and for a squad that coming into the season, we're thinking, all right, you know, let's see. They got a lot of different pieces on the offensive line. Yeah, they got some stud running backs coming off of injury. How long will it take them to emerge? And then all the unknown on the wee fence, as Jim Harbaugh has begun calling it there. But none of that has mattered. And they're beginning week by week to progress and to improve and to become this squad that now over the last couple of weeks, it looks like the offensive line and the ground attack that we anticipated it being coming into the season. And what stands out as much as anything, not just the play on a secondary that's beginning to get healthy more and more, but now they've got a pass rush that can get home without blitzing. And the entire time, the stabilizing force has been their quarterback, has been J.J. McCarthy. And a lot of quarterbacks prefer to be able to throw the football with volume to really get into a rhythm, to establish some precision. J.J. McCarthy hasn't needed that. If he attempts 15 to 20 passes in a game, what we've seen this season is as he, he's able to sustain a level of precision and focus and, and being able to operate both within the confines of the play design, but then go beyond the X's and O's yeah. as well. He, he's just playing at an exceptional level without necessarily attempting the amount of passes that a lot of the other top quarterbacks around the country are getting. Right. It's fascinating to think what he might do if he were asked to throw the ball 40 yeah. times a game, right? right? I mean, where would... How many touchdowns would Roman Wilson have by now? Yeah, right. you know, where, where, in that offense. where would those numbers be? I, I do think, I think it's really interesting. Like, I think back to that Bowling Green game, and they had four turnovers. Yeah. And we kind of said to ourselves, okay, like, hey, maybe there's a problem here. Maybe this is going to turn into an Achilles heel. They've had no turnovers for the last three games. Hmm. So, I, it just feels like if there is an issue... It's quickly addressed. They move on. You could make the argument we won't really know until November. And it's a fair argument mm -hmm. to say, let's see what they do against Penn State and Maryland and obviously Ohio State. But, man, the early returns are very promising. What about that Maryland team? They had that huge spotlight game 
last week against Ohio State. They went toe-to-toe. They, we were talking about the Buckeyes. They were listless. Like, let's give some credit to Maryland. Yep. The problem was the Terps had some opportunities that they let slide by the wayside in the first half. Like, they should clearly have gone into the locker room with the lead. They weren't able to do that. And then Ohio State poured it on in the second half. Now they get Illinois. Illinois is reeling here. How important a game is this for Maryland to reestablish kind of, hey, we're still right there with these top teams? How often have we heard Michael Loxley use the term Terps versus Terps you know, over the last couple I of seasons? I love Terps versus Terps. Because I think it encapsulates what, right. what their issues have been. Right. I mean, I'm sure they went back and graded that film against the Buckeyes and saw a team that outplayed one of the top squads in America pretty consistently, snap in and snap out. And not just by out scheming them in space and kind of setting up some playmaker in the open field, because we've seen Maryland in years past able to do that at times. This was about the line of scrimmage with a lot of still inexperienced talent on both the O-line and the D-line able to give their quarterback time and pass protection, receivers going up and high pointing the football with one hand for touchdowns, their D-line able to stymie the run game of a Buckeye offense that really wants to run the football and had begun to establish that. So this is a team that sees we are capable of that, but then the Terps versus Terps kicks in, and, and you have some of those critical moments in the game that end up turning the tide. So credit to the Buckeyes, their playmakers, for driving on routes, for getting interceptions, takeaways, and not having critical infractions. But from Maryland's perspective, they've got to be able to lock back in in this game against Illinois and not feel like it's okay to sort of sleepwalk against an opponent that's struggling. Can you reestablish the type of dominance we saw through the first five games where they had had a historic start going, winning the first five games by 18 points or more over and over again? They've never done that in the history of their program. Can they now continue to look like that team? Because they look like that team when they were going toe-to-toe with the Buckeyes, even though they ended up losing. Agree 100%. I I think this is a tricky game with Illinois from Maryland's point of view just because you're going to look at the record and you're going to say, oh, these guys aren't very good. And frankly, you're going to turn on the tape and you might say these guys aren't very good. I mean, the lines of scrimmage have really struggled here for Illinois. It is somewhat inexplicable. I'm I'm interested in your take on it. But I think we both believe – I'm still – I still believe (laughs) there's something there with Illinois because Mm -hmm. i got to say, again, we were camp. They look pretty good. They look like a team that could compete for the West. They haven't looked like it at all on the field. I totally get that. They've scored 10 points in the first quarter in six games. Like, it just, some of the stuff blows your mind. However, there is still talent there. So, what do you think is going on here with Illinois, and can they figure it out on the road against Maryland? It is an opportunity to jumpstart your season if you're Brett Bielema in the Illini. It It is a chance now to sort of turn the page to the second act of this year, a first act that's been struggling and sort of middling around and even the wins haven't necessarily felt that impressive, but against this squad and you're looking at it, seeing that, all right, maybe there's some matchups on the outside with Isaiah Williams, with Pat Bryant, because you're a little bit banged up in the backfield, but but if you can say, just Luke Altmaier, protect the football, occasionally give our playmakers a chance to make a play downtown, but he has got to get those mechanics squared away in the pocket, and when Maryland is bringing some pressure, whether it is their front four or whether it's from the second level, he's got to make sure he's protecting the football, living to fight another down, and then when that opportunity presents itself, to be willing and able to strike. It's a delicate balance in a game like this because you know Maryland's offense will present problems to your defense, but you don't want to get into some kind of score fest over and over again against the Terps. Yeah, you mentioned the turnovers. I mean, Illinois was third in the nation in turnover margin last year. They are 117th this year. Like, again, there are lots of different reasons as to why things have gone wrong, Mm -hmm. but that was a huge yeah, part of their success. That's a key one. In addition to that Last line season. of scrimmage, yes. but the protecting the football and yes. not taking it away is Yeah, big. no, it's a, it's a potent combination. And they were really good at both right. last year, and they're not good at either one of them this yeah. year. And, and again, maybe you don't need to dig any deeper than that. What a weekend on tap in the Pac-12. And the future Big Ten teams are right in the middle of it, highlighted by Oregon and Washington. 123-year-old rivalry. This is the first time they have ever played with both of them in the top ten. USC goes to Notre Dame in primetime. UCLA hosts Oregon State. That's a Fox game also under the lights, at least under the lights at at the end out west. Uh, Everyone knows about Michael Penix and Caleb Williams and and Bo Nix, but there are a lot of younger players in the Pac-12 that are making some noise as well. And so for Big Ant's Impact 5 this week, we thought that we would give people a little bit of an advanced heads up. Like, who are the players 
they ought to be keeping an eye on heading into next year. We'll count them down as we always do Letterman style, starting at number five. I, I'm so fond of David Letterman as well. But this is Seacrest style. That's what we do on the Impact Five. I'm going to start with USC and not on the offense, where certainly they have some exceptional talent. Some of that will be gone in the National Football League by next season. But Bear Alexander is a defender who was, who began his career with the Georgia Bulldogs, transferred to USC last season. And he's made an impact on the interior of their defensive front in that Alex Grinch defensive scheme where it's predicated on movement and penetration and attack. And, you know, you pay attention to some of the comments Lincoln Riley made this week. We do know there's still some scrutiny on their improvement on defense, but Bear Alexander has really made a difference with the way that they can affect the opposing quarterback. And when you're going to come play Big Ten football, you need some bodies up front that can impose themselves on the line of scrimmage. And Bear Alexander is a young guy who was a high-level recruit that I love what he's doing and what he has the potential to continue doing in that USC Trojans defense. To your point, he could use some help. They are 10th right. in the Pac-12 yeah. in total defense. So it has not been a great year defensively. And as you say, a lot of people wonder whether that could be a limiting factor for them in the college football playoff race. So Alexander's number five. Who's number four? There are a lot of playmakers for UW, for the, the oh. Huskies to be able to choose from. Yeah. But they've got one of their pass catchers on the outside that I do feel like will end up returning next season in their triumvirate of exceptional receivers is Jalen Polk. And within the offense that Kalen DeBoer will continue to run, then there's no reason to think that if you do get Jalen Polk back next season, that he won't thrive and he won't continue to flourish. You know, and Michael Penix Jr. will be in the National Football League, but the quarterback, the signal caller there, there's a system in place. And having that type of playmaker, we know how great the secondaries have been in the Big Ten for a number of years and certainly this season, but we've also seen Jalen Polk against Big Ten competition this season, and he continues to thrive in doing so. And he, he's a talent that can not only, you know, sort of catch a short pass and be a big threat to run after catch, but he can run the full route tree with very strong hands. He's such an effective wide receiver in a variety of ways. That passing attack's awesome. It yeah. is really fun to watch. You get three NFL wide receivers running around there, and Polk is one of them. Where are you going with number three? So number three, going back to the line of scrimmage, there's a young man who a lot of schools around the country were really hoping to be able to nab, played some as a true freshman last season for the Oregon Ducks, and now Josh Connolly as a full-time starter at offensive tackle, we're seeing how big of a difference the Oregon offensive line has made. Mario Cristobal ended up making, you know, some really good inroads as far as just recruiting guys, especially on the O-line. And Dan Lanning has been able to continue that. And seeing Josh Connolly, who was the top offensive tackle in the nation when he came out of high school last year, now as a full-time starter, yes, as a young guy, there's still some infractions, a few pre-snap penalties and the like. But when you just actually, when the football gets snapped and he's blocking folks, he is doing so at an extremely high level. And again, that line of scrimmage and transitioning to the Big Ten, Josh Connolly is going to be a huge part of the reason why. It won't just be about quarterbacks and operating in space. The Ducks have a player like him up front on the offensive line that will be formidable against Big Ten defenders. Uh, they have a really good defense, too. I mean, I yeah. think that's the thing that, that gets overlooked. Like, yes, they are prolific offensively, but you talk about – on the defensive side, too, they're, they're third in the country in yards per play allowed. Right. And by the way, UCLA yeah. is first. So <laughs> Oregon, with all with everything they got going offensively with a really good defense, they are one of the more complete teams out there. Who's at number two? Number two is a guy who a lot of folks may say is number one. You know, just when you've seen the way that USC's <laughs> offense yeah. has operated this season and all the playmakers that are there that can be accessed by Caleb Williams. But Zachariah Branch with some of the, the ballyhoo that was there when he joined up with the Trojans, even going back and just watching him during their spring game when he got the football in his hands, but certainly in the regular season when he's been a part of the offense, whether it has been on swing passes or screen passes or the intermediate routes in the return game. Every time Zachariah Branch does the football, it looks like there's an opportunity for it to turn into a house call. And so for him, when he comes to the Big Ten Conference, when he's facing Big Ten competition, I don't care what the weather is, I don't care what the playing surface is, that guy, that level of playmaker, when he joins up with this conference, whomever the quarterback is going to be, and they've got multiple high-level recruits waiting their chance, their opportunity to take over in Lincoln Riley's offense, 
there will always be a place as he feeds the studs where Branch will be that guy who's kind of who's going to kind of be the fulcrum for every defense to have their eyes on in the, the Swiss Army knife sort of way that he's utilized by Lincoln Riley. I hope we get a chance to see him against the Irish. He's been banged up here last right. two weeks and, and has missed the game. Lincoln Riley was a little circumspect, I would say, uh -huh. when asked about him this week. He said he suited up for practice. So. <laughs> All right, well, that tells That's us something. everything we need to know. Right, yeah, yeah. Something. Who's number one? Number one is a, a quarterback who's from the Midwest, from the Detroit area, who considered some Big Ten institutions but ended up deciding to go play for Chip Kelly. And I had a chance to talk to Dante Moore quite a bit, even as he was transitioning from the high school level and making his considerations for where he ended up choosing. And frankly, one of the reasons that he said, you know what, I feel comfortable going out to UCLA – is because there was already, it was known there was going to be an opportunity for him to compete against Big Ten competition, to play within this conference. That was just a couple of seasons ago, back when the initial expansion was coming from the L.A. schools. And now you have other schools from the left coast joining up. And there's something about his presence, his demeanor, where everything just seems, you know, easy is a, a really difficult word to use when you're thinking about a true freshman quarterback, but he seems prepared for every moment and every time he's in the lineup, you can see that his brain is like a microprocessor with everything, every piece of data that he's able to ingest, he utilizes it the next time around. And he just throws this easy ball, whether it has to be something with velocity, whether it's something with touch and accuracy. Dante Moore is beyond his years with the way that he can play the quarterback position. And he is extremely mobile as well, but he doesn't have to use it because of the fact that he can throw with anticipation and accuracy. You just feel like the sky is the limit with what Chip Kelly and the inventive nature that he operates with historically on offense, what he can do with a quarterback, with a field general like he has right now. He has a great arm. Yeah. I mean, I know the accuracy has been a little bit of a challenge early on, but I mean, it is a, you watch mm -hmm. him throw and you're like, wow. Right. I totally get why this guy was a five-star. And then I mentioned how good Oregon's been defensively. Like, UCLA's defensive improvement is really, really notable yeah. this year. And so you, you think about more getting older here mm. in this system, and if they can continue to play really well defensively, this would be a very good team. A year from now, they're already a, a And that's where, team. like, all those the other quarterbacks, the other top guys, will all pretty much be in the NFL next year. Yes. You know, Bo Nix. Yeah, Moore's the one we're going to see. Right. There's no reason to think Bo Nix is going to find yeah. any other eligibility. Michael Penix Jr., Caleb Williams, they're all going to be gone. But Dante Moore joining the Big Ten, it's a big deal. Yeah, a lot to be excited about. Those are huge games out right. west this weekend. Apologize for our technical issues with Adam Jardy. We'll hope to get him back here in the not-too-distant future, but unable to reestablish a good connection with him. So we're going to wrap things up with some football. Seven Big Ten teams are above 500. Big three in the East, all in the top six nationally. You got Maryland and Rutgers, the other two from that side, along with Iowa and Wisconsin from the West. And you look at those fives and sixes. Uh, Michigan's already... Wrapped up bowl eligibility. You have a few more with those five wins that could wrap it up this week. Not that there's much question, I think, <laughs> as to whether or not those teams will make a bowl. Like, I'm not mm. sure you're going to see Ohio State celebrating bowl eligibility right. if they beat Purdue this week. But it, it felt like a nice way to kind of lump that group together. I'm curious on your take of what will it take for each one of these teams to kind of be the best version of themselves by the end of this year. So let's start with Ohio State. Like, what needs to happen for them to get to a point where, hey, this is peak Ohio State. The, the ability to start fast is going to be a really big deal because, you know, we're getting beyond the point now where Kyle McCord as a, as a new starter, a first-time starter, being in this or that situation for the first time, it's not going to be as much of a concern. But the ability to come out just firing out of the gate is a big deal for Ohio State because he is still relatively inexperienced as a quarterback, and the team around him may be experienced. But to establish a level of momentum, I believe that Ryan Day can call him into some of that. Now that we have seen which route combinations, which defenses, which paces and tempos Kyle Court responds best to, I do believe calling him into some early aggression in game will be something to jumpstart Ohio State's offense early and then use the pass to set up the run. I think that the balance that Ryan Day really is, is trying to make sure is a focal point for Ohio State is a great goal to continue having. 
But calling Kyle McCord in this offense into some aggression early in game, to me, will pay dividends if you put some points on the board, get some explosive, combustible plays going early for that offense. Now everyone is feeling good and feeling loose, and it should open up the ground attack more. And did not do that, clearly, against right. Maryland. And you just wondered, like, if you dig a hole like that against Penn State or Michigan, mm -hmm. will you be able to dig out of it? I, right. I think that becomes the, the big question for them. What about Penn State? What do we need to see from them for them to be at their best? The, the vertical pass is something that James Franklin continues to be asked about. I, I saw he was asked about it. Yes, 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 that yes. question was there. And whether or not, you know, his quarterback should just be throwing the football into harm's way. And he had some fun, you know, with, with that, that line of inquiry. But he has spoken himself quite a bit about the idea of adding the chunk play, adding the ver vertical pass to their offense, just so it's not these long drives that Penn State has to sort of methodically work their way through on a consistent basis. And frankly, it's not just the passing game where they could stand to pick up more chunk plays. It is the rushing attack because we know that the backfield, and they're getting a bit banged up in the backfield, but it's great the level of depth that Penn State has access to. And all these running backs that they can access – have had the ability throughout their careers to create chunk plays on the ground. And so it's not only about the offensive line at that initial point of attack, but then the tight ends, the receivers stalk blocking in space, making sure that once the running back advances to the second level, that they will continue to be able to advance beyond that because creativity in the open field can be a part of how you get chunk runs. But all 11 guys are part of when a 12-yard gain becomes a 30- or 40-yard gain, and there hasn't been much of that from Penn State. No, I mean, they're last in the Big Ten in plays of 20 yards or longer. Again, they play UMass this week. UMass is last in the country by a wide margin in plays of 20 yards or longer oh, allowed. Wow. So if you do not get chunk plays against <laughs> UMass, then maybe there is legitimately right. a problem. Because, I, you know, people have been asking about this. I think we all think Penn State's really good. Mm -hmm. But to your point, at some point, do you have to get – bigger portions Some of easy the field. points as yeah, well kind of chewed up here right. uh, okay let's go to Iowa I have a feeling with Iowa that it may have something to do with offense <laughs> I mean, I just, again I'm not an analyst okay. myself right but I sit next to some there's been some osmosis through the years uh -huh. is right. it fair to assume that it is it, okay. it is a fair assumption now right. I will say this yeah. because you know Logan Lee and that defensive front, they did get the pass rush going last week. That would have been my item on this list for the Hawkeyes if not for what they did from a tackles for loss and a sacks perspective against Purdue last week. So if you are getting the pass rush figured out and if Noah Shannon is going to be added back to that defensive front at some point, you feel pretty good about what that will develop into. But finding a way to get the wide receivers involved, as was referenced earlier in the show, then that will open up this offense that much more. We do see, I think more games than not this season, the offensive line, really regardless of health, has begun to play pretty, pretty well and establish that rushing attack. And I had the, the opportunity to talk to James Thompson, that Wisconsin defensive line, played pretty well against Rutgers as well, not only stymieing the run, able to pressure the quarterback. So it'll be a difficult matchup for Iowa. But on the whole, the Badgers defense hasn't been elite. They haven't just shut the door on opponents this season. So if they can, make sure that the ground attack sets up some play action pass, not only to Eric All, who I love, but to some wide receivers. That is where Iowa's offense can grow. Yes, at a certain point, you do have to have some sort of a threat yeah. there, I think, to be a, a complete team. How about Maryland? Again, a win this week over Illinois. You're bowl eligible. I think the expectation was that they would be bowl eligible mm -hmm. fairly easily this year. The schedule was conducive to it early on. But what will it take for them to be a team that doesn't just go toe-to-toe -to -toe right. with a ranked team, but that beats one, that beats a ranked conference opponent for their first time as a Big Ten member? It's about details. And the, Mike Loxley just describes this as a player-led squad, a player-led locker room, and in those critical moments, in games, not only in situations where maybe you're trailing or you're trying to mount some sort of a furious comeback, but when you have a lead, when you're trying to maintain an edge on your foe to remind each other of those details, that's a very big deal. It's one thing to hear from the coaches. It's another thing for the players to talk to each other in those moments, whether it is staying in bounds, if it is getting out of bounds, if it is not making a bad play worse against a certain blitz look, that everyone being locked in on those details, that's where Maryland, because they played well on the line of scrimmage at the yep. skill positions, positions on each side of the ball, this is an outfit where when they don't beat themselves, they've been really able to, at times, even against Ohio State, dominate their opponents. It's been rough, though, these last two weeks, right? I mean, you're coming up at the end of the half, and both weeks, 
they cost themselves points yeah. with poor execution. It didn't really matter two weeks ago because the game was already totally out of hand. Yeah. But it mattered this week. Like, if you would have been able to get that field goal, you go into the locker room with the lead against Ohio State rather than Titan, right. it's a big deal. Yep, and maybe Mike Loxley is smiling even more readily <laughs> on a more consistent basis if that's the case. All right, so I will see you on Saturday. Looking forward to that. We are looking forward to that. We hope to see you tomorrow. Be joined by Jake Butt and Joel Clapp. 